So we're at the interval now, and for the next 20 minutes or so, we're going to discuss the very reason why we're all here, the BBC proms themselves. This is the 113th season of the proms. It's also the 80th anniversary of the BBC taking control and therefore becoming responsible not just for broadcasting the proms, but for promoting them as well. This is also Nicholas Kenyon's final season as director of the proms before he heads off for pastures new. The next season will be directed by the controller of BBC Radio 3, Roger Wright. So, what will the new boss inherit? Here are some figures. This year there are 72 concerts here at the Royal Albert Hall, all broadcast on Radio 3 and over a third of them broadcast on television. Over at Cadug Cadugan Hall there are eight Proms Chamber Music concerts and four Saturday matinees. There'll be five additional last night Proms in the Park events, as well as a series of family concerts and even a competition for young composers. So, when the Proms describes itself as the world's greatest music festival, it's hard to imagine anything topping it. But could the Proms do more? What is its main responsibility? And should it be doing anything differently in the 21st century? If you ran the Proms, what would you change? We'd love to hear from you. Text us now on 8311. Email us, proms at bbc.co.uk. One person who's done that is Andy Miller, who emails to say, I would have an annual competition to write an original piece of music on a theme chosen the year before. It would be open to anybody, amateur or professional. Just the performance of the runners-up and the winners in the concert may encourage more people to write, and we might find some gems or even some horrors. Keep your ideas coming in. 83111proms at bbc.co.uk. Well, to start the ball rolling with me here in the BBC4 box, I'm joined by an academic and musician who two years ago wrote a book about the BBC that wasn't entirely complimentary. The Professor of Sociological Anthropology and Music at Cambridge University, Georgina Bourne. Georgina, welcome to the Royal Albert Hall. Um, when the BBC took over the proms in the 1920s, there were some quite strong voices from within the corporation who were very resistant, who felt it wasn't the job of a broadcaster to promote a concert season. Do you think that's changed now, 80 years on? No, I think the BBC should be programming live music. Uh, it's very much an extension of its role nationally in music and moreover commissioning and supporting the orchestras and so on has been a tremendously important and powerful element of its cultural work, if you like, in, in Britain. The question is what for the 21st century and have things moved on since the 1920s? Well, I was going to say the BBC has made huge advances over its 80 years of existence in terms, more than 80 years, in terms of technology. For example, the fact that we're here now on a relatively new digital channel, the fact that all the proms are streamed on the internet. But are you suggesting the proms haven't kept up with those technological changes? No, it's not about technology, it's about music. It's about the fact that musical life today is far more plural than it ever was before. We have a century of the fantastically interesting complex development of new kinds of popular music, music brought to us through new technologies, music created through new technologies, the electric guitar and the wonderful effects that that brought to areas of jazz, blues uh, and rock and so on. And what we need to do, I think, the BBC has to change its imagination to pluralise and bring these languages together more in the 21st but, but century. Why does the electrical guitar have a place in what is essentially a classical music festival? I, the question is whether this should remain a classical music festival in the 19th century and early 20th century definition of the term, and how we understand the relationship between the different musics that make up our national musical life. It's interesting, the BBC has a, a view of music that it's kind of zoned. You know, we have Radio 1 doing that, Radio 2 doing that, Radio 3 does that. But all that began to collapse, interestingly, under Roger Wright on Radio 3 about 10 years ago, when he introduced some fantastically interesting late-night uh, zones, like Mixing It and Late Junction, where you get all kinds of experimental music from classical world, from experimental jazz, from experimental rock, uh, from all colours coming together. And that makes a new kind of condition for the musical language, and it's a very generative one. And it's certainly true that the one occasion the proms message boards go absolutely mad is when something non-classical comes into the proms, be it a world music concert, as we saw a couple of weeks ago, be it Michael Ball singing songs from the shows, as we'll be broadcasting live tomorrow night. Does that suggest to you, therefore, that there's a sort of comfort zone around the proms? It's just become a bit too easy. 
It's a very traditionalist kind of undertaking, isn't it? Witness the endless debates around the last night. Um, and it also has a kind of nationalist uh, agenda to it, which is not a problem for me. The question is, what kind of nationalism? Um, yes, I think that kind of traditional view of the proms, which, of course, you know, seasoned uh, uh, promers will defend to the death, um, is slightly a problem. And that's to say, why do we pay the BBC to do what it does for culture in general and for music? We do it because any great cultural organisation is not there just to reflect things as they are, certainly not just to tell us about the past or reinterpret the past. It's there to give us a future, okay. to make things different from now on. Well, that's where we're up to now. We're going to come back to you a bit later on and, and get some, some suggestions as to where we go next. But let's now go to the, the floor, as it were, the, the place where there are always uh, very strong opinions about what should happen with the problems. The arena itself, Zeb Sones, is down there. Zeb. Thanks, Petrock. Well, yes, what do you think of the proms? What would you do if you were in charge of running the season? Well, you can email us at proms at bbc.co.uk or you can send a text to 8311. Well, in the meantime, I'm joined by three seasoned promenaders. They are David F Folger, uh, Simon Han and Eddie Chilvers. Now, um, if you were director of the proms, what would be the first thing that you would change? Simon, let's start with you. Well, I'd like to congratulate Nicholas... Um... Kenyon and Richard Hickox for moving forward what I thought the repression of the Glock era, but as a member of the British Music Society, at a time when we got picture in Britain, we got history of Britain with Simon Sharma, when are we going to have William Alwyn, Sir Arnold Bax, more Thomas Aides? In other words, is Britain a land without music, as once said, or are we going to tell our international friends about the unhidden glories of British music? Well, David, what's your thought? What well, would you I, change? I, I feel there should be more of the, the sort of lesser-known composers of the 20th century. And we've had one tonight, Martineau. We've got another one next week, Honegger's Third Symphony. Tremendous work. Um, I would actually quite like a big overall plan that would cover, as Simon Rattle did in the lead-up to the millennium, um, a concert that represented each of each ten years or each decade of the 20th century. And perhaps that could be a series that could run over several prom seasons. I think I'd think of so much that I'd want to include. And Eddie, in a fantastic white suit, you must tell me Thank how you keep much. that clean afterwards. How do I keep it clean? I'll tell you. Yeah. But, but what, would be, what would be the first thing that you would change? I think just a few nights a season for cutting-edge music, like uh, loop-based electronica, improvisation, that kind of thing. Some of the much more um, modern stuff. And, and would you have that as the main prom at 7.30 or would that be a late night prom? Or, or, well, or yeah, as a few late night proms, some really cool electronic stuff or some very avant-garde, uh, bizarre sort of modern stuff would be great. And you do that here in the Albert Hall or would you think about ex expanding into other venues? Well, I think it'd be good to have a few of them here in the Albert Hall because it's going to kind of bring people from the sort of classical interest to electronic music and maybe people from the electronic music to classical music and I think it would be really good for that, for that well, crossover. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for sharing your views. Enjoy the second half. <laughs> Petro, back to you. Well, no surprise, uh, all sorts of varying views from the arena. Let's get the opinion now of a man who knows the inside of this hall back to front because he's promoted thousands of concert here, concerts here, here over the years, Raymond Gabe. Uh, what would you do if you ran the proms, Raymond? Um, well, I think you've got a very good base to build on from here. The BBC has always been innovative and has been uh, developing ideas. I think it was very interesting how the other day the, the impression that the youth, youth orchestra from Venezuela, the impression that made was uh, sensational. And it made me think that uh, that's something certainly that I think you could develop in the future. Because to bring young people in, I think there is a certain predictability about the proms audiences. And it would be nice to feel that you might even reach out even further, bring more youngsters in. That, I think, would be a, a, an absolute priority. Uh, taking it from the other end, are there areas where you feel the proms should not go any further than it does. I mean, I'm thinking again about this Michael Ball concert, about the, the nation's <laughs> favourite prom that, that we've had several times in past years that maybe yes. start to tread on your toes as a commercial promoter. Well, I don't think I worry about anything treading on my toes, but I'm not sure whether uh, it would be right for the, the proms to develop that idea of having personality-led evenings like that. I mean, it might be fun. To, you know, it's bank holiday Monday tomorrow. What the hell? Let's get on with it and have a bit of fun with some Andrew Lloyd Webber and so on. Um, but I wouldn't like to see that necessarily uh, extended elsewhere. 
elsewhere, I think that would be wrong. I think what the proms does do, it brings in audiences for the type of programmes that you couldn't possibly sell otherwise. Even the subsidised orchestras would have great difficulty in getting an audience approaching anything like the size of the one you've got here tonight for this same programme. So I think that's a real strength that the proms has and that it should be building on for the future. Now, you're very committed to great musical works of the past and the concerts that you promote. How committed do you think the proms should be to new music? How, how uh, key part of I a brief should that be? I think it's a question of balance, isn't it? It's a, you shouldn't uh, uh, throw out the baby with the bathwater. You've got to have uh, the, the uh, 19th century repertoire needs to be represented there. There's get, people want to hear it. But at the same time, you need to be able to push the frontiers into much more different areas, which is what the Proms has always done. If you look at the list of commissions over the last 50, 60, 70 years, I mean, it's extraordinary the amount of new music that started at the Proms. So I think that's, again, a great strength of the BBC. You know, when the BBC is in a unique position here. It gets three and a half million pounds in uh, revenue from its licence fees. Three and a half billion. A billion, yeah, three and a half billion. And a very small part of it goes on the Proms and the likes of this. But it's very important money that uh, if it wasn't there, there'd be a huge in the business because you see everywhere now the Arts Council money, public money is being pulled back, there's all the business with the Olympics going on, what's going to be cut from arts budgets and so on. So BBC is in a very, very important position and should never lose sight of what it has to okay. do there. OK, Raymond Gabo for now, thank you very much yeah. indeed. Let's go back to uh, Zeb in the arena. Thanks, Petrock. Well, I'm delighted to be joined by two highly innovative composers and performers. It is the composer Gabriel Prokofiev, who is also a club DJ, and the artist known as Genia, who is a virtuoso pianist and an educator and a promoter. Well, welcome to you both. Uh, Gabriel, you regularly perform uh, classical music in clubs, but yeah. how does that work? I mean, are people free to move around? Yeah, totally. I mean, I'm really uh, interested in, in hearing good music in different surroundings and in more relaxed and less usual surroundings than the concert hall. And so um, in a club, people go to the bar, they can have a drink. They used to even be able to smoke, but not anymore. It's here too. If, if, they, um, if they're not into the piece, they can even walk out or go somewhere else and talk. And therefore, people feel a lot more at ease. They don't feel kind of stuck in their chair or anything. But it's really freeing, isn't it? Yeah. Because they, they don't feel that they have to kind of bow down and pay reverence to the piece of music or the composer. Exactly. And it fits in with the lifestyle. You get a different audience as well. You know, I've done some nights with uh, some amazing contemporary music, with Genia performing, the Elysium Quartet. And the audience are all in their 20s and 30s, you know, which is quite rare for classical music. Mm -hmm. And Jenny, I mean, as Gabriel said, you've performed at his club nights. Um, how do you think it benefits an audience to listen to classical music in a club as opposed to a concert hall? Oh, I think it's fantastic because it's much fresher attitude and people suddenly hear classical music in a completely different light. So it actually sounds very contemporary in a funny yeah. way. It brings it back into the present time, exactly. to be honest. And you remix classical music as yeah, well. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that's another... That's kind of a more, almost a musical experiment, playing on the idea of theme and variations, you know, which is an ancient yeah. classical form, and using remix as the idea of, of variations on a theme, which would be an original piece, but using technology to, you know, manipulate the sounds rather than just, you know, rescoring it. So talking about venues, if you were director of the proms, would you think about changing the venue from the Albert Hall? Well, that's the interesting. I mean, you've got such a great venue here, and it's such a tradition that you've got to be very careful. You can't really meddle with that. And I love coming here as well. I mean, what's great about the problems is you can actually sit down, and you can stand up, and you can kind of relax. So, it, But it's got that kind of weight of history and, you know, the, the red velvet and everything. But still, it's kind of got an informal feeling to it. So I think Because I, it's I know you'd that. love us all to go to the pub afterwards and continue talking about it, wouldn't you? Yeah, that's, that's what I've been thinking. If I, if, I, if I ran the proms, maybe I'd rather than try and change the proms themselves, save trying to add a bit more contemporary music, even though it's doing quite well at the moment. Uh, oh, and, sorry. No, I'm sorry. Eugenie, I mean, you work in education, music education. How would you incorporate that into the proms? Well, I think it would be really great if you could introduce lots of workshops and master classes, and particularly for people who want to start playing instruments, because proms are such a fantastic event, and people get so excited about the music. And very often what happens, because I also teach my students, they suddenly, in late 20s or mid 30s, they suddenly hear classical music and want to go and start playing piano. And I think proms can introduce something well, like that. Let's hope all those ideas are incorporated. We'll um, send them on to Roger Wright for you. Okay. <laughs> Petrock, back to you. 
Thanks very much indeed. Georgina Bourne is back with me. Raymond Gabe is still here. All sorts of ideas there, experimental electronic music, uh, the club idea, making it more relaxed, losing that, that sense of reverence. What do you think about those, Georgina? I think there are, I'm very, very struck by what Gabriel was saying and have very committed to those ideas myself. I think you can't do all kinds of music in the same venues, and the Albert Hall has a certain ambiance, a certain, you know, and we need new kinds of venues. In Paris now, they do festivals across the city in different kinds of venues chosen for different kinds of music. It's a great way to do it on the Callaghan Hall. The other thing I'd just like to add is that, you know, the way music evolves is through the conversation between art music and vernacular and popular music. And it's making those languages come together for audiences and for musicians and composers that's so important. And do you think that's a problem, that actually music has cut itself off? I mean, it's the old debate, isn't it, about you don't get music reviewed in the same way that you get people who write books talking about theatre and film? Well, you say that, but I was reading some Sunday magazines on the way down, and there were different kinds of music reviewed next to each other, but we never have them perform near each other. They are discussed in similar terms now. We know that other kinds of music than classical music have value. They have great aesthetic power. And lots of younger generations, as Gabriel was saying, relate to them. We need to change this whole mix of the generations and different musics. Raymond, as, as, as Roger Wright will know well, if you start tinkering with something like the proms, straight away you have tens, hundreds, millions of people out there saying, leave it alone. I can just imagine the response to people watching this now saying, we don't want drum and bass, we don't want electronica, we want the great symphonies performed by the great orchestras. Yeah, but the proms has always been innovative. It's always moved on. If I think back 40 years or 45 years when I first started coming here, the type of proms you had then by comparison with what you've got now, the atmosphere was so different. So it has evolved. It's not stuffy, it's not uh, as formal as it was, it's much more relaxed and it's been moving like that over the last, well I say 40 years that I've been uh, watching what's going on here. So I, I don't think it's in any way stultified. I think it has moved on, but I think it's important to keep that uh, moving. Some of the ideas we've been hearing are very interesting. You can't be, I don't think all things to all men. I think the proms and the Albert Hall do go together hand in hand. You, do, you can have events outside, you've got the, the events going on in Cadogan Hall, you've got the proms in the park and so on, but essentially the Albert Hall, to me, is always going to be the proms. That's what defines it and what goes on here. And just a thought, Georgina, the BBC is moving in that direction, isn't it, with the electric proms, which, which started last year? I slightly disagree. You see, for me, proms in the park is populist. It's an attempt to bring the families in and make things friendly. I don't think that is the BBC's entire role. The BBC has to be cutting edge. We give it public money to help take risks and experiment and promote innovation. And I'm absolutely with Raymond. I mean, it has to both give us the wonderful repertoire it gives us, but also help new music to grow and be heard. And very briefly, Raymond, to finish, you've missed the ad this time round. He's yes. already been appointed, but yes. you applied to run the Royal Opera yes. House a few years back. Would you like to go running the proms at some I point? I did it very much tongue-in-cheek for the Opera House. And uh, so I don't really have any aspirations. I've got my bus pass now. I'm very happy to potter along doing what I do. I come here 70 times a year with all kinds of different things which I enjoy in all around the country and around the world. So I, I wish Roger Wright absolutely well. I hope he has a long term running it. I have got no aspirations at all. Good. Well, we've covered some very interesting ground. Raymond Gabbe, Jutrin thank you very much indeed let's uh, get some more response from you Zeb has uh, some more emails down in the arena Zeb yes indeed Petra we've been inundated with texts and emails you certainly haven't been shy so thank you very much these are my favorites uh, Philip White asks why is the magnificently restored Albert Hall organ so underused so come on Roger Wright let's make more of the organ next year uh, Alan Cathcart suggests that there should be some evenings when the whole audience not just promenaders have to queue to buy tickets uh, I wonder how that would go down. Uh, Roger Miller says, I would dump the traditional last night programme and fly the Simon Simon Bolivar Youth Orchestra over every year. Uh, I think lots of people agree with you there. Uh, Timothy Kelly says, please just leave it as it is. There's an anonymous text saying, proms, just music please, no gimmicks, no emails, no chance. Bob Miller in Chelmsford says, the proms should represent a mix of all things English and all things new. Uh, Adam Gray talks about the lack of jazz at the proms. He says, considering that Radio 3 is supposed to be a jazz, classical and world music station, the jazz provision at the proms is somewhat minimal. And a text from James Bingham in West Yorkshire says, televise all proms on BBC4, no excuses. Well, I think we'd all agree with you there, so thank you very much, James. Um, so thanks for all your views. Roger Wright, I'm putting these in an email and sending it to you. So, Petrock, back to you.
So thank you very much indeed. Zoe Martlou, Steve Martland are back with me once again. Before we move on to Prokofiev 5, let's just get your thoughts on the prom. Steve, what's, what's right and wrong about the season for you? Uh, well, I don't want to get into that. If you were, I think that two things should be addressed, if that's all. One is I think that we need to hear music by a lot more women composers and we need to hear, see more women conductors. And secondly, I think we really have to address this problem of this audience, which is overwhelmingly horribly white. We live in a, a diverse culture, particularly in London, and we have to reflect that diversity in the audience. So we need to do something about that, I think. OK. Zoe, are you concerned about issues like this, or, or, or do you think we're being a bit carping here and that actually the proms don't do it too badly? I think they do pretty well. And this is um, a classical music festival, and if we're going to open the boundaries a little bit more, we're going to have to redefine what that means. Um, and I would, I would say that I would like to open the boundaries um, a little bit more to include the rest of world classical music. So not just Western European tradition, but I think we do a wonderful job here, and if I was running it, I'd simply expand on what we have already. And I think we've got a wonderful amount of new music going on, on here. Well, I'm sure that there's much to discuss on the message board. Uh, do go to the Proms website, keep the discussion going there. Nicholas Kenyon, outgoing director of the Proms, will be my guest live during the interval on Tuesday night. So do text us uh, or message us uh, any questions for Nicholas Kenyon. He will be here Tuesday during the interval. Let's move on to the final work in tonight's Prom live here on BBC4, Prokofiev's Fifth Symphony. I suppose ever since Beethoven Five, Fifth Symphonies have always been regarded as something of an iconic event. Prokofiev's was a wartime symphony written in 1944. Do we get a sense of that wartime setting in the piece? Surprisingly very little. He said that this was a symphony about the greatness of the human spirit. And uh, I would say that that's uh, very much Soviet speak. Um, this, is, this is music written in the language of Romeo and Juliet. It's in your face, romantic Russian music. Um, the language of Romeo and Juliet, it freely borrows from Cinderella, which he wrote the same year, and bits of film music. And we have to remember that Prokofiev was a prolific film composer, Stalin's uh, favorite art form, luckily enough for him. And you can really hear it in this. It's emotive, it's dramatic, and above all, it shows off his lyrical genius for um, huge melodic uh, sweeping lines. See, we talked about the sense of exile earlier on, that all of tonight's composers, either living in exile or, in Britain and Prokofiev's case, just returned from exile. Prokofiev had been back for, what, eight years uh, in the Soviet Union when he wrote this symphony. And he seemed to have realised that there was this need to conform at this point in his life. Well, the whole idea of exile in the 20th century is quite fascinating. All the great Eastern European composers, and, in fact, not only Eastern European, did have to leave their homelands. Schoenberg did, um, Bartok, Stravinsky, Prokofiev, uh, Hindemith. They, I mean, if you imagine that now, if that number of British composers suddenly had to leave for political reasons, I mean, it's unthinkable, really, isn't it? It's quite an interesting thought. Although what's interesting is that Prokofiev himself decided to go. I mean, Shostakovich said it was like chicken mm. to the soup. But he himself wanted to go back to the homeland. And mm. he said he was not a political animal. He went there because he was going to get paid on time. He would get his compositions performed. He was homesick as well, I think. And uh, I, I think conforming is the wrong word. I think that people lived in very dangerous times. And I think what it shows is that a truly great composer even under the duress of that Soviet system, can still write great music, regardless. Course, little did he know that within a few years' time he'd go from being the darling to being a, a figure persecuted widely by the Soviet authority and to he, die on the same day as Stalin. He wasn't persecuted so much. I think the Soviet system actually suited Prokofiev's particular style. It was a very direct form of communication with the audience. And this is actually what the Soviet authorities wanted. And I feel that he would have written what he'd written, regardless of the system. Well, let's hear his fifth symphony, Jerzy Jelachlavek making his way onto the platform to conduct the BBC Symphony Orchestra at the Proms this Sunday evening. Prokofiev's Symphony Number no. 5. <laughs> 